Uh, you'll want to thank the uh, uh, presenters that uh, put this together, Dr. Fox and the engineers, for their wisdom when they decided to have a token economist on the program. They wisely did not put me on right after lunch. So uh, let them know that you appreciate that. Um, Dr. Melstrom is here. I'm uh, the old guy in the cheap suit making the presentation, but if you need uh, some tough questions answered, that's why I brought Dr. Melstrom. Okay, so as you, as you wonder what the heck's going on, and he says, oh, crap. Uh, okay, so uh, I don't think we've got to make too much of this for those of you in this room about how important water is to agriculture in Oklahoma. Uh, it is the lifeblood, as, as uh, Claude said. Um, more than three-fourths of all the precipitation that falls on this state goes first to agriculture. They are the first users. They're the first managers. And it's a heck of a trust that they have been doing very successfully. So when people take what agriculture does for granted, I think this is something that we can occasionally remind them of, that uh, agriculture keeps this trust uh, going. The direct impact of, Oklahoma, of agriculture to the Oklahoma economy, uh, ag has an output of over $30 million a year in this state, um, employs over 200,000 people. So when you start seeing problems with water, such as with droughts or uh, movement of water out of agriculture, that's part of what you're going to be affecting. Um, doesn't mean we should always go that way, but it's an important factor to consider. So uh, we're here to talk about uh, groundwater, but we've sort of got to cover surface water as well. There's about 11 million acre feet a year that come into the state from river basins. We've got over 1,400 square miles of water area on the surface in Oklahoma and over 160,000 miles of rivers and streams. Uh, basically the surface water component of our situation in Oklahoma and we've got over 20 major groundwater basins that are uh, holding nearly 400 million acre feet of water. So when we talk about whether or not we have a shortage of water in the state we sort of recognize what the base is and here's what we're doing with it. We allocate a little under 4 million acre feet per year to about 11,000 permits for groundwater. We allocate stream water, a little less than 3 million acre feet a year to about 2,000 permits. And this is how much flows out of the state estimated about 36 million acre feet of a year flow out of the state uh, through these river basins, Arkansas and Red River. So the reality is, yes, we can have years where we got water shortages in certain places, but the real problem is allocation, getting it where, when, how much, and at a price we're willing to pay. That's, that's the challenge. And I think you all know that, but to put it in that context begins to show the surface of the com complications of being able to manage this great resource that we have. So if you wonder where and who is using the water, uh, we have about uh, 1.8 million acre feet a year in demand. This was based on the 2010 uh, water study that the state did. Uh, it fluctuates a bit from year to year, but it's not much different than that now. Um, about 42% uh, of that goes to crop irrigation in the state, and much of that is in the panhandle and central part of the state. Um, about 5% for livestock, and then you see this big chunk over here between municipal, industrial, thermoelectric power, oil and gas. So it's close to 50-50 between agriculture and these other uses. And the big challenges, of course, over 
the next coming decades as our population increases and it tends to increase in the urban areas is whether or not people are going to continue to be supportive of this kind of distribution of water. So there will be challenges possibly to water law, to water policy in the state legislature. So let's look at where some of these uh, issues are affecting the water supply. Uh, as I said, a growing population. We're not growing as fast as Texas, but we're likely to see some significant increase in population when the water study was done. They projected to the year 2060, and we're looking at uh, somewhere between uh, uh, 10 and 20 percent increase in population in the state economic development, rural areas as well as urban areas see that uh, water is one of those uh, basic issues that they've got to make sure is available before they start inviting uh, new businesses into the area. Ethanol production, depending on uh, what uh, method is used to produce ethanol, uh, it uh, runs anywhere from four to six or seven gallons of water per gallon of ethanol in the production process. So as we uh, promote renewable energy sources like ethanol, we'll see that uh, that may challenge water use in some parts of the state. Um, thirsty neighbors, Arkansas, Texas, even New Mexico are interested in more of Oklahoma's water. Right now we have a moratorium where we can't sell water out of state. Uh, that's likely to change over the next <coughs> decade. Hydraulic fracturing. I'm just nearing completion of a study on hydraulic fracturing in the state. We've got uh, six scientists and a librarian uh, on the project. Uh, we've got about a 120 page report, Leland, that we've uh, about ready to, we're about ready to send out for a review. Um, but hydraulic fracturing does use a significant amount of water. I'll show you a graph or two down the road here in a minute. Uh, tribal rights, uh, the state is negotiating with tribes about water use. If you go back to the Winters Doctrine of 1900, the Supreme Court uh, case that basically gave primacy of water rights to uh, native tribes, uh, for decades, the state uh, chose not to, to negotiate much with the tribes, for better or worse, and uh, as the tribes have been more successful in their economic development, primarily with casino money, uh, they've been able to uh, uh, in, increase their legal uh, power and challenge the state, and so there are discussions underway about uh, how the tribes are going to be able to uh, have their say in the water in the state, and that's going to upset some areas of the state in water use. Uh, weather volatility, whether you want to talk about climate change or just the volatility of weather, I'll show you a chart here in a minute about that, uh, and then some of the others. Invasive species, I encourage you to talk with the people in NREM about this. Uh, a few decades ago, maybe as recently as 10 years ago, we kind of used the rule of thumb that every red cedar tree took about 100 gallons of water out of the ground. Uh, new research shows it's much less than that, but it does take some water, so uh, uh, you might want to check and see what the latest research has to say about that. Uh, we haven't been investing in developing water sources to develop uh, uh, dams and retention for water and uh, that came out in the water study and uh, and we'll probably see the state beginning to do more of that. The question is where are they going to do it and uh, whose water access is going to be changed for better or worse for that to happen. So that's a public debate that has yet to occur uh, and will affect agriculture uh, and that's part of the changing water law and water rights as we look to other states that have preceded us in uh, dealing with change of, of water rights in their states. Uh, we have uh, indications that uh, agriculture is probably most at risk as those 
discussions occur because there tends to be fewer and fewer people in agriculture and owning agricultural land and their political power may be challenged by a majority of people who uh, care more about other things. Uh, so a uh, myriad of issues, uh, you know, how many of these things were uh, uh, recognized maybe 20 years ago. Uh, several of them there just came up as surprises uh, over the last decade or so. So when we say unknown or unexplained events, what else is there out there that we haven't identified yet that will be a challenge to water use in the state? So, uh, you know, stay tuned to that. Uh, aquatic life, vulnerable to minimum stream flow has become a challenging issue. Uh, agriculture and uh, industrial development and oil and gas industry tend to be on one side of this issue and environmentalists and uh, uh, people in uh, rural communities that uh, have their economies based on recreation mostly on the eastern side of the state or on the other side of the issue. It was one of those hot button points in the water study that came out in 2010 and uh, We'll see uh, the results of behind closed door meetings that have been taking place on that minimum stream flow probably in the next couple of legislative sessions. So, you know, that's sort of where the challenges are. Here's some of the things that we can look forward to to maybe have a positive impact on retention of water, uh, better management of water, conservation, of course and many of you have had programs on that within agriculture, but it goes beyond agriculture. Um, investment in water infrastructure, I mentioned a minute ago, the state is finally starting to talk about that. They've started investing money for uh, long-term programs of investment, and there will be discussions that uh, will result in uh, the uh, planning and the development of uh, new uh, water retention facilities in the state over the next decade um, through structures. Uh, drought and flood management, uh, you, you probably wonder sometimes whether there's any management going on with that, but uh, I think we're probably doing a better job than we were a couple decades ago in that regard. The water board takes that very seriously. Price of water plays a factor in the use of water. You keep water cheap or free, and it tends to get used and abused and wasted. As price of water goes up, people begin to think more about conservation and management of it. Uh, drought tolerant plants, I'm not sure how much of that discussion's going on in the state. Uh, Sala and Scott will talk about irrigation systems here this afternoon. Uh, we're seeing more reuse of water. Um, hydraulic fracturing, that's become a a matter of improving efficiency of the operation and, and it has been somewhat successful. Uh, desalting water, all of that uh, water we get out of the ground uh, during the hydraulic fracturing process, as an example, is uh, so salty that it's highly toxic. It's saltier than ocean water. And uh, there are some people with deep pockets experimenting on uh, how to uh, economically desalt that stuff. Um, and it could also solve the earthquake problem if we figured that out because uh, uh, that deep injection of that water is uh, the primary cause of the induced seismicity in the state. Um, reuse of petroleum pumping water, I mentioned that. Uh, red cedar eradication, while they don't use as much water as we used to think they do, it's still an issue. and. Uh, uh, absentee owners of land are, are a real challenge in trying to manage that problem on a lot of, lot of uh, pasture and agricultural land, wetland use, uh, signing property rights. Uh, we uh, need to do a better job of that in this state probably and who knows what some of the other issues are. We've uh, uh, seen that if we reduce uh, polluted runoff that it improves water quality so water we thought was no longer useful for humans and livestock uh, may be of use. Uh, there's a cost here uh, but as, uh, as we move into the future and there's more demand for water 
this becomes a more viable option. So you look ahead to the water study and uh, say where are the problems and uh, you, if you live in these areas you already know this probably. Uh, but these are the primary areas where they're going to have major shortages of water uh, where they're projected to occur in the state and what's going to be the primary uh, factor in that. If you look out here in the west central part of the state, there's challenges to both ground and surface water in uh, 50 years and irrigation is going to be the primary factor. Uh, so challenge there if you're from that part of the state or you uh, serve as farmers and ranchers in that part of the state is helping them look ahead to this so that they are on top of it and they've managed it to their best profitability rather than having government come in and uh, lean over their shoulders and tell them what they can and can't do. Uh, southwest part of the state of course has been a real problem through the drought. It's uh, starting to come out of that but there are some years as you know where they just couldn't grow a, a cotton crop because of the lack of uh, moisture. Uh, surface water is the primary issue in 50 years and again irrigation. Look down in the beaver cache area, surface water and here municipal and industrial there's you know desires for development of that part of the state and uh, they will be challenged to be able to do that because of the shortages. Uh, ground and surface water up here in the central part of the state, the greater Oklahoma City area, um, municipal and industrial, but I might also say if, if you'd seen one of my presentations a year or so ago, uh, the fastest growing areas for small farms in the state are within an hour's drive of Oklahoma City Center and Tulsa Center. And so there are lots of small farms. Some of you would say they're not real farms, but uh, people like me coming back home to the state, uh, getting ready for retirement, maybe looking at servicing local markets and wanting to put uh, pumps into the ground and get water out. So municipal industrial will be the primary challenge, but there's this sort of hidden concern that uh, the growth of those small operations wanting to tap in uh, may also become an issue. So other parts of the state, of course, will have their own challenges, but if we think about, okay, where are they likely to develop, to develop new retention <coughs> processes to have a dam and a, have a lake, uh, or to talk about pipelines going across the state, these are going to be the top priority areas. And this one's probably going to have the biggest straw. So just be ready for that to occur. Some of you have seen this. I've been showing a slide like this since the 1990s. Uh, Dr. DeVeast has picked it up and, uh, and done some uh, livestock management programs with it. What you're looking at here is the last 100 plus years of precipita precipitation in Oklahoma. Uh, average about uh, 34 inches a year. And uh, where you see the green hills above the line, that's wetter years and the brown mounds below the line are the drier years and uh, the individual dots are annual so that you could, if you look carefully, you can see that even during a very wet period, once in a while you can have a very dry year. Or during a very dry period, like our last drought, you can have a very wet year. And so when you have those wet years in the middle of a drought and people say, thank you Jesus, the drought's over, and we say, well, be cautious, and sure enough, the next year we're back in the drought period. Here's the message I've been giving with this, and I think it's, it's more common knowledge now, but when we started in the 90s, it would really grab farmers' attention. Most of the farmers you work with, they or their families began farming, began ranching, began banking and giving loans to farmers, began serving in the legislature, developing pro programs for farmers and ranchers during this period of time. So everything they made decisions on was based on 
this looked like what the real world was in Oklahoma. Now there were a few old codgers, old farts like myself, that said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> is this the norm or is this the aberration? Because it sure looks like what the real world is, is every five to ten years the cycle breaks and changes. And if you don't recognize that, you're setting yourself up for disaster. And sure enough, people that learned to think this was reality, this was the norm, here we break as we move into the 21st century. And it's too soon to tell, but it's beginning to look like we're back in a cyclical pattern like this, that this may be the long-term norm for the state. So, take that for what it's worth. Now here's what I've done here is, here's that what you just saw, the precipitation map. Here's the temperature map. And you hear people talk about the great drought of the dirty 30s, and you see how dry it was, and you see how hot it was. And you look in the 50s, which people still talk about as a major drought period, how dry it was and how hot it was. And here we are, maybe just coming out of this one, how dry it's been and how hot it's been. And again, I'm making no conclusions about climate change, but at least we can talk about the weather variability and say that uh, droughts do occur periodically in the state. They're hard to predict. Uh, we've got people here that could do a lot better job at it than I can, but uh, I'll just leave it at that. I think risk management rises to the top and managing water resources rises to the top in managing risk. So this is not an insig insignificant thing to share with the producers that we work with. <coughs> So I'll let the uh, water board talk about uh, groundwater rules in detail, but just to introduce them, all <coughs> surface and groundwater in the state, other than domestic and household purposes, requires a permit from the water board. There's a process to go through to do that. And groundwater is a legal property right to the owners of the land above it. Most of the permits are for groundwater. And you can look here to see, uh, here's about 11,000, as I said earlier, for about 3.8 million acre feet. And some of these are prior rights, some of them are regular, and some of them are provisional temporary use. Uh, where do we draw the line between uh, the domestic situation and the uh, use for agricultural purposes? In domestic, you can still have some agricultural use, but it's limited by like three acres and, and a certain amount of water. I'm going to let Chris. Three acres? Yeah. Um, irrigation on land over three acres requires a permit, or if you use over five acre feet of water, you require a permit. Three acres and use over? Five acre feet of water. Okay. Good. I'm glad you got here, Chris. Welcome. <laughs> Okay, now just to show you real quick as I wrap up, I'm sorry I'm maybe going over. Uh, this just, provisional temporary permits have been an important part of the story of water use in the state. And I just want to make a point to get to the oil and gas hydraulic fracturing here and not go into detail about all that this says. But that road along relatively stable, some variability up until the first decade of this century and we began to see temporary permits really take off. And so we examined that and that's all provisional temporary water permits for the state back to 95. And if we look at that for oil and gas use primarily and primarily for hydraulic fracturing, look at the mirror image here of what's been going on. So, and again, I'm making no judgments. I'm just helping you recognize the complexity of the picture 
you know, when you see that pie where it looks like irrigation and livestock use half the water in the state, yes, but it's been a very interesting challenge in some parts of the state where hydraulic fracturing took off to see the great increase in water use there. And it suggests that people who had normally been considering the availability of water in that county for decades thinking that it would be about like this now need to recognize as the economic bump of hydraulic fracturing comes through their counties that they're going to see a big change in the distribution of water in those areas. And that could have an impact to farmers and ranchers down the road. Now part of this is because of the downturn in price. It's also because they've been working on being more efficient at using this water. And if we can get back to higher prices, we'll see whether or not this goes back up or it stays uh, lower than this because of their efficiencies they say they're gaining. I'll let you look at these on your own. I'm getting the hook, but uh, this shows you uh, uh, the aquifers in the state, so you can look at what kind of aquifers underlie your part of the state. Uh, here's the uh, 100,000 wells that we know about in the state. There may be some we don't know about. Um, groundwater wells. This shows where there's water quality issues, these bands, uh, nutrient loading into uh, those aquifers. And uh, if you uh, talk to me later, we can talk about how different ways we can advise uh, our landowners to price the water they have if they want to sell it to someone else. Okay.